Hi, this is Making Geek, and I'm Dan. This is not going to be a build video this week. Instead, I thought it was probably time to do a bit of a walkthrough of my CNC machine. I've used it on a few projects recently, and that's only going to increase. I'm pretty happy with how everything's working right now, and I thought it might be useful to some people, at least, if I kind of walk through what are the bits that came with the kit, what I've had to add since, and kind of what their purpose is. So if that interests you, stick around. Hopefully you'll enjoy this. This is the Ox by Ozenest. I have the one meter by one meter kit. It arrives in pieces and you construct it yourself, which I rather enjoyed personally. The, the kit comes with all the metal parts and the mechanical pieces, the motors. It did not come with the, with the cable tracks. I added those later. It didn't come with a spindle. I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, it, I did buy it with a power supply for the electronics and it came, I bought the electronics kit with it um, but that's basically what you get. You get the metal bits, the motors, the electronic kit, um, sort of the bare bones to make something physically move around but you don't get the router, uh, you can add that yourself uh, and you don't get any of the other frills that I'll talk about shortly. This workstation I added quickly to my table it just provides me a simple computer and monitor. Uh, there's a Raspberry Pi down here, which is what's driving the controls to this. So this just lets me run the uh, control software. So my workflow is that I can develop on my laptop uh, the CAD and CAM models, then just copy those files down to the Raspberry Pi and use this as a standalone system just for controlling the CNC. So the most significant thing on this, obviously, that I need to add beyond the kit was the spindle. Now, they actually recommend you go with a standard trim router. A lot of people you see use kind of Bosch and DeWalt trim routers. Uh, they're good and they're light. Um, what they are is very noisy. This is a 2.2 kilowatt water-cooled uh, spindle. It is quite a bit heavier than those trim routers, and uh, Usnes did warn me that that was kind of outside the range of what they'd recommend, but I decided to proceed anyway. Uh, I actually had the spindle from my first attempt at making a CNC machine, which I kind of built completely from scratch. Uh, but this is a great spindle, and the main thing about it is that I can crank it up full blast, and it is really not very loud, uh, and I might demonstrate that in a bit. Uh, it's got water cooling, so these orange pipes out here run back to a bucket down the back, which is full of sort of basically an antifreeze solution and a, and a standard pump and so that just switches on when I'm in operation keeps things nice and cool so far I've been able to run this for five or six hours straight and whilst in the hot sort of middle of summer that was starting to get pretty warm um, it was excellent very very good cooling you may also notice that this is attached to his nest by these very scruffy wooden uh, mounts again that's a holdover from my previous CNC machine I, I really want to buy a much nicer mount, it's just that they tend to be quite expensive and if it, if it works, don't, don't change it. Uh, this is the VFD that came with the spindle. This basically controls the voltage into variable frequency to make the spindle go at different speeds. Uh, I, when you power it on, it takes a few seconds to, to gear up. Um, up it fires. Now. This is really awesome and flexible. There's a whole control panel behind here, and this wire here is coming from the CNC control board that I have, and it allows it to send signals to this to how fast it wants the spindle to turn, so the program can completely control when the spindle comes on, how fast it goes, and when it goes off again. Uh, all I have to do is press that button to engage it at the beginning, and then it's under completely the control of the system. Just to witness that, so here what you see is I have a spindle on button and when I tick it, you can hear that things start to spin up and that's the machine firing up to whatever the pre-configured speed is and if I untick it, it all shuts down again. So that's really helpful, that means that I can have that completely under control of the program. I don't have to worry about the fact that the spindle is going to keep spinning if I'm, I'm not around when the job finishes. What you also hear is just how quiet this spindle is. And this for me is the little game changer as opposed to using like a trim router. 
is I can still work in here, I don't need ear defenders. It's obviously a little bit noisier when it's actually cutting wood, but um, I find it very acceptable and I can just leave that running for a long time, work around it, um, work that all day long. So let's take a peek at the electronics. I'll just move it forward. Let's go a little bit quicker. This is the X-Pro USB CNC controller that came, well, it was one of the options that I picked with the kit. Um, this is basically an Arduino uh, running uh, gerbil, or grebel, however you want to pronounce it, um, which is a pretty decent open source CNC control software. Um, I won't go too much into the wiring of this, obviously they come with diagrams. I think the things I will point out are a couple of standard PC case fans just there. Uh, and they just blow air across the board uh, when in action this thing does get pretty hot if you don't have some kind of active cooling but a couple of case fans keeps this smooth as I mentioned I've run this thing for five six hours straight uh, without any problems so I've been running this thing for probably a good couple of months with essentially the base kit the my router on it and the control setup um, and that's great as a beginning thing, but there's a lot of things you can't do with just that setup. And there are a couple of key things I've added recently that have really been game changers for me. And the first of those things are limit switches. So here I've mounted a switch on the x-axis and over here on the y-axis and tucked up beneath the a Z carriage, there's another one just behind here that trips at the, at the max extent of Z. And so those uh, are all connected. The, the, the electronics board does come with, the X-Pro does come with uh, connectors for limit switches. And so it's just that the kit by default doesn't come with the switches or, or any way to mount them. This prov they provide this cr crucial capability, which is in the software, I can issue a command which tells the machine to go home and it will track to the top extents of Z and then the far extents of X and Y and it will always get back to exactly the same position. And this is super important for being able to do consistent repeatable jobs. So let's just see how that works now. So we're just gonna issue, issue a dollar H. That's the control home command. And then let's watch what the machine does. So it first very quickly found the Z home. And now it's running both X and Z together, X and Y together, sorry, until they hit their switches. So X has already found its mark. Y is coming back. At this point, it makes a very, sort of comes off a little bit and then slowly goes back to find the exact point that that switch triggers and then backs off by uh, five mil, which is configurable. And now the machine is in its home location, which the machine knows uh, exactly where that is in space. I can always get back to it even if I switch the machine off. And so that's sort of step one of being able to do some good repeatable work. The second thing I've added recently relates to this little fella here. This is my uh, impression of a touch plate or a touch off plate. I've got mine mounted flush with the base of my workspace. <clears throat> you can also have uh, devices that you put on the corner of your stock which allow you to kind of touch off from there but I found this to be very useful. The touch off plate combined with the ability to home adds uh, another critical feature. As you get more into doing CNC machine work there are a couple of things that you tend to stumble into which is your stock isn't really level, your bed you may struggle to level it or keep it level um, and if you're trying to do delicate work, like V-carving is very popular, you can see people carving signs, um, you can come a cropper because oh, the height of one piece of your uh, stock is not really the same height as another because it wasn't perfectly flat compared to the machine, and so you end up cutting too deeply in some parts or not deeply enough in others. Now, kind of the, the way you solve that uh, in CNC machining is to do a facing operation where you take a larger bit and it sweeps across the whole of your stock to create a level which is essentially parallel to your uh, router. Now, that's fantastic, but then you have another problem, which is you really want to do that facing operation with quite a big bit, otherwise it takes forever. Uh, you certainly don't want to do it with the V bit. Uh, so having completed that facing operation, you now need to switch your tools 
but still have the same reference position for how high Z is supposed to be. And that's kind of a key challenge, I guess, of hobby machines. Uh, it's big Tormax, etc. I have very clever tool change mechanisms that know exactly how long all the offsets are. But for this kind of machine, we need to come up with a way of being able to switch those tools around so that we can do these operations with the right tool for the job, but not lose our reference points. So how do we do that? Well, we've already seen that we can put the machine into a consistent home state. Uh, now what we need to be able to do is measure the tool length, and that's where the touch off plate comes. Important command, G28. And actually when I type that, you can see that it wants to auto-complete it to G28.1. So what do these do? G28.1 tells uh, your machine to store the location that you are currently at as compared to where your home location was, uh, and just remember, remember that offset. Then G28 will always take you back to that location. So if I issue a, not G28.1, but just a G28, it moves the axes to bring the tool directly over my touch off plate. So this is a known offset. This means I'm now again within the machine coordinate system. Uh, I know exactly where I am. And now enters the last part of this picture which are these two crocodile clips. So I have these clips connected to the CNC X-Pro. Uh, it's not very well documented, but there's a little set of pins inside the board, which is designed to have kind of an external connector for things like start, stop, uh, pause, run control, etc. that you can pull out to a, a remote control, etc. cetera. Um, but on there also, in a particular mode are essentially the pins that control tool probe. So what this means I can do is I can clip one pin, one, one clip to the touch off plate and one to the tool. Now I can issue another special command that will measure the tool length. Now the, the nature of the way this works is it approaches very slowly. So what I will do first is just quickly get it pretty close. So let's just drop Z down, one more, right, so we're right just above, in fact, I'm going to back off a little bit just so you can kind of see what is going on, so let's zoom you in, okay, so we now have our our router in a, a known position over the touch plate. We've pushed Z down to, to just close to the surface there. And now we're going to issue another important command, which is G38.2. So this is a command where I can tell it that I want it to go up to negative five on the Z axis. So if it gets to negative five and it hasn't touched anything, it's going to stop. Um, and I give it uh, a feed rate, a very slow feed rate because it's going to approach very gently, I want it to stop exactly at that point and not press in. So here we go. So it slowly approaches and the second it touches, it stops. And that's all it does. Uh, and so now I know, okay, the bottom of my tool is flush with my workpiece. And between uh, different parts of my CNC machining, I can repeat this exercise with any tool I put in and I can always get back the tip of the tool to a known place. And that is crucial. That itself hasn't really changed anything about the work coordinate system. So far, we've just been working with the machine coordinate system. So as you get into CNC, you learn that there are these two different things. The machine coordinate system is what uh, we've dealt with when we've homed and when we've had reference points. All of that is related to kind of the machine's sense of its own kind of size and location. But for any given piece of work you want to do, you typically want to create a work coordinate system based on the stock, how big it is, where you want to start from, all that kind of stuff. So at this point, this is where we kind of uh, set where we want that work coordinate system to exist within that machine coordinate system. And for that, we have another couple of commands to learn. So up here, you can see the work coordinate system uh, and the machine coordinate system. So the machine one is the one that we've really been caring about so far. And you'll notice they're all negatives. That's uh, part of the way Gravel is set up. It knows how big the machine work area is because I've configured that. And it considers home to be the sort of the maximum negative point in that. And that's just a convention. So the work coordinate system right now is a little bit all over the place. Uh, it's really 
only relevant in terms of its reference to the machine calling system. But now what we do know is that we consider ourselves to be at Z0. And so what I can issue over here is another command, which is G92, which is G92. And this lets me explicitly state where I think each of the axes is right now. So if I say G92 Z0, what I'm now telling it is, hey, your work coordinate zero. But I haven't changed the X and Y yet because I need to go find that. Now I have the Z uh, configured to zero, I can manually move the X and Y around. I can bring the Z up, move the router over the work, work area, clamp my piece down and determine where I want to start the job. And this is where you need to combine what you've been doing in CAM to create your tool paths with what reality is. So within Fusion 360, when you first set up a CAM job, you do a setup, you find your stock, and you tell Fusion 360 what, co what your work coordinate system is related to that stock. And typically, I always set zero to be the bottom of the stock because I know that that's my reference plane. This is where I can get my tool tip to. And so it will always think of my models in kind of positive Z with the bottom of the model being zero. Um, and depending on what I'm doing, sometimes I set X and Y to be in the middle of the stock. Sometimes I do it in one corner. It really depends on, on kind of what I need to do. But whatever I've done there, I mimic here by putting my stock down, moving the tip to the whatever X, Y location I've told um, Fusion 360 is gonna be zero. And then I can just issue another G92, but with X zero, Y zero. And then I have got my work coordinate system tied up with reality, which is the machine, and connected to my cam job. And so now I can begin the job, um, and then depending on what I'm doing, I might set X and Y to be zero, maybe in the middle of the stock, or maybe in the corner, whichever I think, think is important. Sometimes um, another challenge is that whilst you might have a piece of wood, which is nice and square and has straight edges and 90 degree corners, getting that attached to the bed and completely aligned with the X and Y of the router may not be that straightforward. So it can be easier to just accept that you're gonna be outside of that, carve from the middle inside of a piece of stock and then have a trace operation, cut yourself out uh, that square or kind of out, outside profile in line with the router. And once you've done that, the world really is your oyster. This is actually the result of one of the first jobs I've done using multi-pass and I mentioned I was first able to face off this to make sure I had a completely flat surface to work from, then switch to a drill which drilled all of these holes to a nice consistent depth, then switch to a very fine piece which I don't know if you can see that, which etched in all of those tiny little letterings and numberings. Then finally I actually was even able to flip this over and mill out a little pocket for the pegs and again I was able to align all of that with the model, flip it over, get back to the right place on the machine um, and uh, mill out even some little holes for these magnets that hold this in place. So that was a real success um, from Fusion 360 to the real world. So I hope you found that useful. Um, it was just a random collection of thoughts but it's the sort of information that I guess it would have been helpful for me to have when I was starting out with a CNC machine. Uh, just some of the basic commands and processes to help you achieve that consistency and be able to do stuff like tool switch. Um, it's a shame that the Expro CNC doesn't come with more instructions about the probing. Uh, it took me a while to find that information um, and it's been as I say, a complete game changer to be able to make sure that I can consistently change tools uh, and get back to the same heights. Anyway, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. See you next time.